everyone. We are the Historic Alliance of Cook County. Our collaborative group was formed in 2023 after a year-long study funded by a Heritage Partnership grant from the Minnesota Historical Society, and that study was facilitated by Superior Design and Planning. Four of the historical societies in Cook County looked at how we could collaborate to better tell our stories. Now that we are formed, we're reaching out also to the other heritage organizations in the county to grow the alliance. Um, out in the lobby today, we have information about both the alliance as well as the partner organizations. So this is our first collaborative event, and we're excited to bring you some great stories today. But before we, we begin, we'd like to give some quick introductions of the partner organizations of the Alliance. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Steve Shug, and I'm the president of the Schroeder Area Historical Society. Um, we formed in 1996, but it took us a little while to get a building, and if you're familiar with the Cross River Heritage Center in Schroeder, uh, we found the funds to renovate that building, and it's a wonderful facility. But I wanted to just touch bases quickly on this fo uh, formation of the Alliance. I'm so excited about this. Someone came up with the idea. The four of our partner um, historical societies got together. We had professional planners helping us. This is the first joint thing that we've done together. So, But I have a challenge for all of you folks. Pick an organization that you like, preferably one of these historical societies. See if you can volunteer a skill that you are good at. Become involved in our historical societies. I think that would just be great. So become a member of the board, volunteer, volunteer a special skill. That's my challenge to you all. And thanks for having us up here today. Hi, I'm Rana Hansen Lavore, and I'm with the Tofty Commercial Fishing Museum, Tofty Historical Society. And our group was started in 1993 with my mother, Mary Alice Hansen, Ginny Storley, um, Greg Tofty, Brian Tofty, and Dennis Rizdahl. And Florence Wessler started a little bit later with the board. In 1996, we opened our building at the old location of the Standard Station in Tofty. And so we are actually the oldest, I think, functioning of this group um, right now. We are open from May through October. So we're almost at the end of our year and we've had an, a very good year. We have had over 2,000 people visiting the museum this year. Hello, uh, my name is Ashley Hatchett. I'm with the Gunflint Trail Historical Society. We were formed in 2005, and in 2010, uh, the society was able to open the old Chickwalk Lodge up as the Chickwalk Museum. In that period of time, uh, we have added a watercraft exhibit building, a nature center, a trapper shack, which is brand new this year, and an interpretive cabin. And weekly as well during the season, we have speakers that come in on the weekends on various topics. And then we have a set day where the Forest Service also does presentations. So come on up, we're open until Sunday, <laughs> and then uh, hopefully reopen again on Memorial, um, flooding notwithstanding again this year. So <laughs> thank you. And I'm Katie Clark. I'm with the Cook County uh, Historical Society. Cook County Historical Society was formed in 1925, and today we operate uh, five sites that keep us quite busy. Uh, we operate the county's 1896 original Lightkeeper's House, and we operate that as the Historical Society Museum. Uh, Johnson Heritage Post Art Gallery, uh, the St. Francis Xavier Chippewa City Church, Bali Blacksmith and Metal Fabrication Shops, and the 1930s fish house replica with the uh, fishing tug Niji next to it. So all that keeps us busy. We're just wrapping up our season uh, and it's been, it's been a great run this year. I think now for the stories. To start us off today, we have Brian Tofty. Brian Tofty, he's a local historian and the grandson of the founders of Tofty. Uh, he's a collector of oral histories and images of retired Lake Superior fishermen, boats, structures, and families. He's also one of the founding members of the Tofty Commercial Fishing Museum, and he serves on the Cook County Historical Society Board. And today he has a couple stories from his family. Thank you. Our family was, uh, we had lots of, my brother Greg's here, by the way, in the audience with his wife, Meg, but, but I was just saying that we grew up with lots of uncles that were storytellers and a father that was, couldn't stop telling stories. So just over the years, it kind of resonated in our minds, I guess. 
But we're also fortunate to have, um, on, that was on our Norwegian side, on our Swedish side, the Anderson family, and Lori Spry here, who's here today, she's our cousin. Uh, we had a whole raft of other stories from that side of the family. Um, but today I picked out a couple that my Uncle Ted wrote. Um, I should say that the Tofty General Store Gazette was a, was a small um, newspaper that was printed out of a home, <laughs> my brother Orton Jr.'s home. Uh, and he realized, he was our oldest brother, and he realized that we had to start getting these stories down on paper. Uh, so the Gazette lasted for a few years, um, but Orton and his wife Karen would go around to the locals and collect stories from them and, and again print them in the Tofty General Store Gazette. So I, the first one comes from the Tofty General Store Gazette. This is a story about some Finnish loggers that came into our grandparents' uh, property looking for a job in my grandfather's camps, uh, logging camps. So this is the story by Ted. Uh, back in those days, it was customary for my father and Uncle John to carry on a logging operation during the late fall and early winter months. Fall, particularly October and November, was the most uh, productive period for fishing herring, the source of a substantial part of their living income. As a result, the opening up of the logging camps was generally delayed until after the big run of herring. One year in late September or early October, two men came to our house one morning and asked to see my father. They were immigrants from Finland who spoke broken English, which was hard for my mother to understand as she was quite a recent immigrant from Norway herself, but they managed. Mother explained that father was out on the lake and he would not be home for an hour or two. They said, that's all right, we wait. When father arrived, they explained that they had heard he and Uncle John ran a good logging camp, a good camp, they said. Father said that they did not plan to open up the camp for at least three or four weeks, and that nothing had been done yet to prepare the camp uh, to get it ready. The one who did most of the talking waved his big right arm <laughs> to help show his feelings, and he said, oh, that's all right, we fix camp. There was a big, happy grin on his face, and he said, we like work. No work in Duluth. That's what they all, the families on the North Shore call Duluth, Duluth. We fix camp. Oh, so father was taken aback by this unusual and friendly insistence. He hesitated a bit, but then he went on. The walls have to be chinked with moss. Some of the stovepipes may be rusted out. We don't have any food supplies yet no cook, and I can't possibly take the time to show you where the camp is. Again, with a big grin, he waves his big right arm in a sweep as if to wipe out all these problems. And he said, oh, that's all right, we fix camp. And then he says, we just need a little Arctic and toast, which is hardtack and toast. That's all right, we like work. Then a look like an unspoken please. Clearly, father was unprepared for this kind of sales pitch. Even in those days, most prospective workers wanted to make sure there was a good camp, a good cook, and good food. Father glanced at mother, but there was no help from that corner. She had caved in long since, and she looked and said, a look that said, give him a job. Father shook his head, you can't even find the camp, and I don't have time to take you up. Oh, we find camp, find road, find camp, camp, just a little arctic and dosed. And he waved his big arm again as if to wipe away all insequential problems. Father capitulated, he said, okay, let's take a look. And off they went to the storeroom, behind the blacksmith shop, he took out two blankets, two axes, one two-man crosscut saw, a file, a kettle and a frying pan, and a coffee pot. Then they went down to Uncle Hans's store. Fortunately, Uncle Hans had a good supply of hardtack and toast. Also, he had some summer sausage, coffee, salt, pepper, and sugar. The men looked very pleased. 
Then they returned to the blacksmith shop and father helped them pack. Fortunately, a big Duluth pack was a standard equipment for every self-respecting lumberjack in those days, the equivalent to a suitcase and trunk today. But there was no room to spare. Pots and pans hung outside. Mother had prepared dinner, and the two men grinned broadly at her to show their pleasure. When they had eaten, father got up and said that they'd have to hurry. It was getting late, but not so fast. Before hurrying off, they turned to mother and said, good cook, good cook. And their smiles and faces said even more than those spoken words. Father drew a rough sketch on a small piece of board showing the road and the camp. The road from the camp due north up to a, a large lone big pine. Their faces brightened. Yeah, big pine, we find. Then turn left about 100 paces till you see the skidway. Yeah, skidway we find. You can start cutting beyond the skidway. All right, all right. And he took the piece of board and put it in his pack. Father took them up the path and led them to the hauling road and pointed the direction. With loaded packs on their back and axes and a saw and a water pail, they set forth. Then after a bit, turned and waved goodbye. Three weeks later, father said to mother, I'm going to open camp tomorrow. I've got to see what, those, what my Finn boys are up, are, are up to. Pete, Mons, Mons, Monson, and Sure are restless and they want to get started. Sure said he'd cook. The next day in mid-afternoon, they hitched a horse to the loaded stone boat sled and took off for camp. They got there about four o'clock. No one was home, but all signs pointed to the fact that all was going well. The camp had been brushed down, swept out. One bunk was made up. Both stoves were in operating order. The water pail was full. Father told Sure to prepare a good supper, potatoes, fried salt pork, and bread and butter. Shortly, the men returned. They spoke enthusiastically about how well everything had gone. Good camp, they, he said, pointing to the walls. We chink logs. Father grinned his approval. After washing up, all sat down to eat, their appetites whetted by the wonderful camp cooking aromas. The two Finn boys ate heartily and with relish. Toward the end of the meal, Sure bought a plate piled high with hardtack and toast. And when the men looked up, he said, do you want some hardtack and toast? Both men caught the joke and with a broad grin, the spokesman with his arm in a broad sweeping way said, take it away, take it away. No more high tack and toast. <laughs> now there's just a little, little piece to fill in the time. <laughs> but uh, this one's called Sand Hill Pete. One of the men who drove a team of horses in the Ingalls and Tofty logging camps was known by the name of Sand Hill Pete, where logs could not be floated down a river they would be hauled out of the woods and down the hill to the shore, shore of the lake on sleighs. Pete would build a fire on a side hill, thawing the ground enough so he could scoop a bucket of sand. As he stood on top of the sleigh, Pete knew just how much sand to dribble into the ruts to keep the heavy loaded sleigh from sliding into, into the horses, well, I never knew Sand Hill Pete to have an accident. There were several accidents, incidents that were, where less skillful teamsters had a sleigh get away from them with disastrous results, occasionally pushing a team of horses partway up the tree further down the slope. Since there was usually only one road or trail up the hill and into the woods, it was custom for the team coming up the hill to yield to the team going down the hill. Since no driver could stop a load once it started down a steep hill, um, to accomplish the system, the teamster came coming down would holler, turn out, turn out, at the top of each hill in a voice loud enough to give warning to all below. After Sand Hill Pete, which was by the name, his name is Pete Olson, uh, after he retired, he continued to live 
near Tofty, walking to and from town to get his mail and supplies. In about 1937, the walk became too much for his advancing years, so he bought a Model T Ford. On one of the trips to town, his car got rolling a little too fast for the grade. The people on the streets in town, two miles below, swear that they could hear Peter hollering, turn out, turn out, whoa! <laughs> yeah. Does that make fun of this? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a wonderful crowd we have here today. I'm uh, Bob Hewitt. I'm with the Schroeder Area Historical Society, and I want to give an opportunity to uh, introduce a person who has a longevity here in the area. His name is Peter Hall. And the Hall family has uh, been here for four generations, and they have some stories to tell. So I'm going to inv invite up to the podium then Peter Hall, and he can entertain you uh, with many, many interesting stories. Well, thank you, Bob. I'm Peter. I'm, like I say, he said I'm the fourth generation that's here. There's uh, six generations actually on the homestead at this point. Um, but I can give you a little background of, of where they came from and how we got started in this county. Uh, my great-grandfather, Hans, was from Kristiansund in northern Norway, and my great-grandmother was from Grog in Norway. Well, they met on the North Sea on their way to England to uh, come to the United States. Well, Helena, she was sick as a dog. She was not a seafaring person, so he kept bringing her water. It's the first time they ever met. Well, they got to England, and they parted their ways. Hans came to America down through Canada uh, on the St. Lawrence, and Helena caught rail and went to Minneapolis. Well, Helena's rail to Minneapolis went great, but when she arrived, her aunt and uncle were not there to pick her up, so she was left on her own. The station manager luckily spoke Norwegian because she didn't speak any English. Well, he was able to get out of her where her aunt and uncle lived and gave her a ride. He got her ride, and of course, they were very apologetic for, for not being there to pick her up. Meanwhile, Hans was in Duluth uh, working in, with his brother as a landscaper and a timber cutter uh, north of Duluth, and he also did carpentry work. After a couple years, Hans wrote a letter to Helena. <laughs> she was going to dismiss the letter, but her aunt said, with that handwriting, you really need to meet this guy. He had the most exquisite handwriting you'd ever see. I mean, it was beautiful. So ensued, in May of 1887, they got married, and they lived in Duluth. He was working, and she was, you know, working and raising four kids. They, boom, boom, boom. And of the four children, it was Julia, Cornelius, Emil, and Helen. And of those four children, only Julia went to Canada. The other three children stayed within the county here. They left Duluth shortly after the kids were born and moved about 15 miles north of Duluth uh, where he could commercial fish and build boats. Well, he liked moving so far north that he said, you know, they're giving away quarter sections of land in Cook County. So let's go up there and homestead. And if we live there for five years, we get the land for free. So ensued, they, they headed up the shore. They found a place five miles east of Lutzen, where the homestead is today, and he liked that property because he had enough bottom land where he could farm, potato farm virtually, and he had 40 acres of cedar for building his boats. They, they came and arrived and built their first home and moved in in 1901 is when they first moved in at a small log home. I have a calendar out front that has a picture of their original homestead, and it's kind of cool if you want to take a look at it. They were raising the kids. Helen also did this, uh, Helena did this in Duluth too. She was also a midwife, but she got exiled from being a midwife because she was not licensed in Duluth. So when she came out the shore, it was a different story. She made rugs and was a midwife also. She, several of the children were born with her being a midwife on the West End. 
And through that, they earned their first two heifers, and that started their cattle herd in Lutzen. You know, that's how she was able to get milk. And of course, once they got milk, Hans was excited, so he had to make her a butter churn right away, so she could actually have some good homemade butter. And uh, Hans was also kind of funny because in the winter, he would make sure that he had 100 pounds of lard, so he had donuts. He was a donut fiend, loved to have donuts, had to have donuts all winter. So he had their donuts and that. <laughs> but they cleared the land, of course they had a good, uh, a good sized garden. And they built the house, of course, with two barns. And then they had their small, uh, oh, well he had his woodworking shop that he built boats out of. One canoe that he had built that is hanging in my father's garage that he has varnished and you can still use it, but you row it instead of paddle it. You sit in the middle. It's a low-sided boat, beautiful for duck hunting uh, and fishing. You know, they used to throw nets out of that all the time. My dad and Donnie Schulte used to get in all kinds of trouble in that thing. But anyhow, <laughs> that's here and there. Uh, Hans, you know, did his workshop and building his boats, he built one for, oh, he was a judge, Edward F. Waite, which was delivered to Hovland. He built several boats that went to Duluth and to uh, other commercial fishermen along the lake. And he even made one for uh, Phoebe and Carl Nelson, which they still have, which was given to uh, Willard, which I assume now that uh, Dickie Nelson owns it. In those days, you know, in 1901 thereafter, there was a lot of fires within the county. So a lot of the area over the hill from the lake were pretty well burnt off and you could see the moose running from one edge of the hill to the other edge, you know, as they were hunting. That was part of their main diet was moose and deer and fish, of course, because he commercial fished off of uh, Caribou Point and Lutzen. But uh, he would go up and ski, and through skis, he made his own skis. I have a couple of those yet, too, that he had made, the cross-country skis, so they're pretty old. He made them out of birch because they slid so well on the snow and they didn't peel. But um, they would go to Brule Lake, and he would fish through the ice up there for lake trout. And on his way there, he would stay with uh, Yelmer Hegberg at Yakmok Lake. He had a cabin up there. And anyhow, they also had a still there. For some odd reason, it was a good place to go. So, you know, he had a multi-reasons, not only to fish in that. There's also a pond in Lutzen, north of Lutzen, called Hall's Pond. That's where my great-grandfather, Hans, he had his uh, hunting, his moose hunting camp out of. It's down in a black spruce swamp, just south of the, the pond a little ways. There's still remnants up there. I know I've had a forester from the state say, you know, you still left junk up there. I said, well, that's kind of typical for the time. You never know, you're gonna need it again. But some of the moose meat at that time, they'd pack it into salt brines. And when they'd put it in a salt brine so they'd keep it, one of the places they would store it was on an island out on Caribou Lake. And one of the reasons why they stored the meat out there was because the porcupines couldn't get to the barrels. The porkies used to go out there and chew through all of the barrels and then they'd lose the meat, you know, it'd go bad. And for some odd reason, I don't know why porkies like that or if they wanted to get at the salt, but I remember the story. And I have been on the island and found a few of the old barrel rings that were still left out there, so it's kind of funny to see. They would also get their supplies from Duluth a lot and they would either row or sail to Duluth, and once in a blue moon, if the weather was right, and they were headed at the right time, they could catch the America or one of the steamers heading down from Caribou Point. If the lake was rough, they'd have to row out into the lake to get on the boat to be able to, to go up or down the shore. I know one thing, they came here with pretty much nothing, and our families learned to pretty much keep all of that. That's just pretty simple. <laughs> And uh, the, you know, one of the good things was about being at that time and era for those people was that they relied upon each other and all of the neighbors that surrounded themselves. Each one of them had their own talents, their own gifts, and they all gave them to each other freely and relied upon one another for help here or there or whatever, and was not really charged anything for that. You know, it's just part of what should be done. As for the original buildings from our home site, they've pretty well all gone back to the earth. And one of them really went back to the earth in the 70s when my father was approached by a, a couple that were building a cabin and they wanted and wondered if they could get the old 
hand-hewed beams and uh, outside boards from the barn. Well, they took all of those old boards and then they built an earth home. It's on the north side of the gravel pit if you're going into uh, Pancor Lake. And to me, of this day, they're still being used. So those are 1903 and 1904 logs that are still in use, which is kind of cool to be a repurposed item. I guess I know one thing is kind of neat. I've, I've had the opportunity. I've been to Christian Sund, uh, been to the old farm, which is still in the, the same family, still family name, and I've put my hand on uh, Grandpa Hall's name. He carved it in the side of the barn when he left it when he was 21 years old. So that was kind of neat to see. And uh, I still use a couple of his old oil lamps from the old homestead. You know, they work perfectly fine. I, I live off grid. I was like, I'm not hooking up. So <laughs> that's kind of cool. Uh, I guess pretty much to end it, I had one of the early settler descendants tell me one time, uh, never, never forget where you came from. I think that was probably the best advice I'd ever received from, from somebody. Remember your roots and remember who you are. And if you came from dirt, remember that because the individual that told me that's a millionaire a few times over and she never forgot where she came from. And I really respected her for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> I am delighted to introduce uh, Mr. Bill Douglas. Uh, he has been coming up to the end of the trail since the late 50s, and in 1972, he and his delightful wife, Sue, um, decided to make the plunge and bought Tip of the Trail Outfitters, uh, actually from the folks that he will be talking about, so he has a personal connection to them. Thank you, Ashley. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're here to talk about the Blankenbergs today. Uh, those of us on the trail know them as pioneers. So I looked up the definition of pioneers. A pioneer is a person who is among those who first enter or settle a region, thus opening it for occupation and development by others. That fits the Blankenbergs to a T. Um, so Russell um, went to World War I in 1972 with the Engineer Corps. After the war, in 1918, he attended the University of Toulouse in France, played on their baseball team, and studied chemistry. In 1920, he joined his mother, Doris, at Lighthouse Lodge near Eagle Lake in northern Wisconsin. And even at that time, people were coming that far north in Wisconsin from Milwaukee and Chicago, mostly by rail, and they were asking, well, what's the next furthest place? So Doris sent Russell out on a mission to find the next furthest place. And he came to the canoe country uh, in the early 20s and heard about the Gunflint Trail coming to Hungry Jack Lake, which was as far at that time as the trail was built. When he heard that a road might extend up to Gunflint, he canoed up to Gunflint to see where he thought the road might come in. And if you've been to Gunflint, it wouldn't be that hard to determine where the road would come in because there's such a high hill on the south side of, of Gunflint. And apparently Jack Price, who was then the governor of Minnesota, owned some land on the Canadian side of Gunflint that had mineral rights attached to it, so he decided that he was gonna extend the Gunflint Trail to Gunflint Lake. In 1923, Russell was invited to the Brooklyn Dodgers spring training camp in Clearwater, Florida. Russell was a good baseball player Babe Ruth was on the Dodgers team at that time. And according to Russell, he held his own um, and spent a short time down in Florida. And Florida at that time uh, was only accessible to Southern Florida by the Flagler Railroad, which went all the way down to Key West, but largely undeveloped in the Southern part of Florida. But he was talking to this uh, Orange Grove owner and this guy told him that if you're really interested in orange groves, he said, there's a little town south of here 
where they drill a hole in the ground and put in a, a stick of dynamite and set it off and put an orange tree in there and it grows like crazy. Well, this was all coral, so there were lots of nutrients there, of course. And uh, so Russell was interested in this and, and this little town that he was told about but was, went by the name of Miami. So you can assume if Russell had been buying land down in Miami at that time when it was accessible only by railroad, <laughs> He'd be quite a wealthy man. He first came to the Gunflint in 2324. He and his mother, Doris, started purchasing properties. The first one, September 2nd, 1925, on through the years up into the 30s. So they acquired 76 properties in all. In 1924, he started Gunflint Lodge with his mother, Doris, later sold it to the Spunners the parents of Justine that went on to build Gunflint Resort. In 1926, he started building Seagull Resort. He heard that the trail was going to extend to Seagull, so he bought land on Seagull from a Civil War colonel who was a gold prospector and lived in California. Russell traveled out to California to buy this land. And Russell was interested only in the sand beach on Seagull Lake, but this fellow wanted to sell him two miles of seagull and he thought that was going to be too much for him but they ended up buying it and ended up selling it all for quite a pretty penny down the road when the road was completed in 1929 to seagull it was a a tough trip to town usually taking about eight hours muddy up and down hills uh, it was an all-day ride to grand marie Eve, whose family was from the Iron Range, met Russell in Duluth, where he asked her if she wanted a job at his new resort on Seagull. She accepted and was impressed with Russell from the beginning. She said, at dinner we were at, he ate four huge bowls of soup. I figured I couldn't go wrong with a man that was that easy to cook for. So they married. Russell was 34, Eve was 19. They married in Barnum in... October 18, 1931. They had one daughter who seldom returned to the trail, had two children who came to visit Russell and Eve in the summer. Most of the structures at Seagull were log because you could hire men for a dollar a day for good log work, and that was cheaper than it was to buy lumber. The lake trout limit on Seagull at that time was 20, a little bit lower now. Um, Russell purchased a carload of very, in his words, very fine cedar boats built in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. They used the same boat company when they had their resort at Lighthouse Resort in Wisconsin. He was most impressed about these boats. I remember him telling me the story with the oars that came with the boats. He said they were light pine oars with copper tips and leather around the oar locks. Very fine oars, in his words. And as guests want to do, they always want to go to the next lake. At that time, the road ended at Seagull, and the way to get to Saginagaw was to portage around Sag Falls and go through a couple rapids to get, to get out into Sag. And the guides then, these boats didn't have motors then, but they used the oars to push their way up and down these rapids. And Rupp Russell was very dismayed by the fact that his beautiful oars were getting all beat up. So he decided, along with Art Nunstead, to build a road to Saginagaw. And when I say build the road, I mean they built the road. The routine was that they had a little dump truck and they owned some property that had a sand pit on it and they'd drive down there and load up the truck by hand with shovels. And then Russell would back the truck up where they were building the road and Eve would get up in the truck and shovel the sand out where the wheels went and build the road that way. So it was a rather meager road in the spring. It flooded, uh, even to the point where fish were swimming across the road. He tells one story about guests coming in the spring and when he would go to help them, they had their, their, their suitcases in the back and carry their suitcases into the cabin. They were full of water going through the roads. Russell brought the Saginagot property from Weyerhaeuser Timber Company, whose office was in Cloquet, 
Um, he made several trips down there to buy that property. They had a wagon that they built uh, that they would improve the road with that had two by fours with round ends on the bottom so they could be turned over and dump out the sand on the road and then spread the sand out. Well, the biggest challenge on that road was the swamp between Sag and Seagull. We call it the dip and to this day it, was, it still is an issue and keeps sinking. Russell, uh, in order to try to avoid the swamp, he went to Washington and asked the Forest Service if he could get an easement over their property around this swamp. And they told him, uh, not one foot. So they were forced to have to build the road across the, uh, across the swamp. So this is a picture of the Blankenbergs. Russell, we called Russell the country gentleman. He always had his top shirt of his shirt buttoned. And he spoke uh, with perfect English in a very soft manner. They were really kind and gentle people. Eve was more of the workhorse of the two. Here he is again with his top button buttoned. Um, this is on the property with the canoe uh, and she, Eve did all the splitting of the wood, and you can see across the way of Sand Beach, that's where Seagull Resort was, and their property uh, is one of the most beautiful properties, I think, on the trail with the view down Seagull Lake. It was quite a beautiful spot. And their modus operandi was they would build a resort, sell it, move up, build another resort, sell it, move up, build another resort or outfitters and sell it. That's how they sold a lot of their property. And when they sold property, um, and we kind of went through this drill with them, he always started with the worst piece of property first and kind of went down to better property as you spent time, which was a lot of time, to finally get to the property that you wanted but he wanted to sell you the hardest piece of property to sell first before he got to the most desirable piece of property. And it says here, that help, Russell helped organize Arrowhead Electric, so he, he brought power to the Gunflin Trail and power, of course, to his properties that he had along the Gunflin Trail. This is uh, a, a ticket for the, the road they, that they built between Sag and Seagull. They, they had a toll road that they charged people to go up to Seagull. The Nunsteads bit, built Chickwalk Resort and the Blankenbergs called it Saginaga Fishing Camp at the time, uh, later became known as End of the Trail Lodge. Russell didn't like paying property taxes. He always was complaining about property taxes and spent a lot of time down at the capital to argue with legislators over charging property taxes. He helped bring in and maintain the single wire telephone service that served the trail early and also did a lot of prospecting on the trail. He was a strong believer that the same ore that existed over in the Ely area existed here. And one of his trips back home or back to a lighthouse resort um, he ended up taking a detour someplace and ended up in some guy's uh, mansion. And when he went to ask directions on where he was, started a conversation with this guy who was an attorney representing a company that owned Grand Marais. And I guess at the time they expected Grand Marais to be quite a large metropolis, so they had it all platted out and surveyed. And Russell was offer, offered the opportunity to buy Grand Marais for $30,000. And he actually made a $200 earnest money payment on that property, but he decided later on that the taxes were so high it would eat up any profit that you'd be able to have along the way. So he was thoroughly convinced about taxes. Uh, in the winter time, they would spend, they, they had several nice homes with all the conveniences, water, electricity, but in the winter time, they liked to live in a little cabin on Seagull that was, oh, it was maybe 16 by 24. It was a one room cabin. It had Eve's wood cook stove. That was the only form of heat in it, outhouse, of course. 
And uh, that's how they chose to live their, their winter days. They didn't really travel much in the winter. They spent all their time up here in the wintertime. Eve was unique. Uh, she cooked on a wood stove until her last days on the trail, kept her store-bought cookies in the stove when not in use, and claimed she was the only person on the trail who packaged and baked cookies in one complete step. <laughs> She'd tell people she can get a lot of wear out of one shirt. And if you look at any of these pictures, you'd see uh, Russell kind of had the nicer shirt. Eve, you know, sort of had his hand-me-downs. And uh, she said on the first day she wears it forward, second day she'd wear it backward, third day she wore it forward inside out, and the last day she wears it backwards inside out. <laughs> Saves on wear and tear and washing, I guess. Russell died uh, at age 88 on May 25th, 1983. Eve died at the age of 92, uh, March 8th, 2001. Eve uh, was from the Iron Range, met Russell in Duluth, as I said before. But Eve um, died at the age of 92, Everyone thought she'd live forever. Uh, they were very healthy eaters. They'd eat a clove of garlic a day. Both had a little kind of a strange odor about them. <laughs> was more Eve's choice than Russell's, but it was hard to imagine that this independent little woman with dirt under her fingernails, unkept silver hair, and well-worn old clothes would not live forever. That's just the way it goes, I guess, with some of the best people, but they were truly unique, wonderful folks. That's it. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is Steve Shug. Hey, it is my pleasure to introduce to the, our next speaker. Her name is Ruth Kepke. Um, I first met Ruth this last June when she came to our Schroeder Area Historical Society annual meeting as our guest speaker. And she has an interesting story to tell about a young woman's first trip up the North Shore landing in Schroeder, Minnesota. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ruth Kepke. Okay, good afternoon. Why did I come to the North Shore? I came here because this man in Schroeder had a garage, Ella Smith. Maybe somebody here remembers the Smiths. Well, in 1948, when he was working in his garage, people came in and they said, they hiked the river, Cross River, Temperance River. Now if you'd have something to drink, we'd be very happy. And he thought, oh, I got a couple daughters that could sell pop out at the river. So he got a wash tub full of ice and set his girls out selling pop by the river. Then they started saying, well, perhaps if you had a snack or food of some sort, it would be a little better. He put them out there. He took an old oil shed and he uh, put a propane burner and a kettle, and the girls heated hot dogs in that big kettle, and they sold hot dogs and pop. And that year, it went so well, he got the idea of, why don't I build a coffee shop? He owned quite a bit of property around. They had Smith's cabins. So he, in 49, started building this, which people here knew it as Cross River Cafe. But it was Smith's Lunch when I came here. Brand new building. Okay, how did I get here? Or why did I come here? Um, the Smiths would always close everything in after Labor Day and moved to Mora, Minnesota. I attended the same church that the Smiths attended. 
One day at Sunday school, Sandra, who was 16, said, my dad built this coffee shop. I sure wish I knew somebody that could come and help me in the e shop. My hand went up real quick. I had just recently been let out of Hamlin University. I was in the nursing program and I could not continue because of asthma. They said I might be sick a lot and be out of work. So I was very happy to say, I'll be there. So early on in May, my dad brought me to the bus depot in Mora, and I had one small suitcase, got on the Greyhound bus, got off in Duluth, got on another Greyhound, got off on Highway 61 in Schroeder. I was 18 years old and been here ever since. So the girls, the one that was 16 and I was 18 at the time, we moved in upstairs in the coffee shop, very unfinished room, big room. And we made the best hamburgers on the North Shore. <laughs> and her mother made the best pies on the North Shore. So we did really good in that building. The Smiths came here, probably both of them got here on the steamer America. Ella Smith came because of lumbering. His grandfather was in the lumber business, had a garage, first of all, right where the Cross River Cafe was built. Both of them, like I said, came on the steamer America. And uh, Era Smith uh, was a school teacher, and that's why she came here. We had a lot of uh, good times at the cafe, and when uh, September they closed it after Labor Day, Ella Smith took me back home to Mora, Minnesota. I lived on a farm. On his way back to Schroeder, he stopped in Beaver Bay, his friend Art Lawrenson. Everybody knew everybody on the shore at that time. He stopped there and he said, you don't know where I could get a good waitress, do you? He said, yeah, I just took one home. <laughs> That's when uh, Hunk and Arundel Dixon was there just beginning the reserve mining company. That's why I've been here ever since. <laughs> Never left. Loved the shore. So Schroeder is still my, it's in my heart. I now belong to the Bay Area Historical Society. We have a nice uh, museum and uh, information center. So if you come in Silver Bay, some days I'll be there. Thank you. concludes our storytelling for today. We are so thankful to all the presenters who um, told us their story today. Could we please give them another round of applause? So Cook County's uh, cultural landscape, it's rich already. Um, and through sharing our stories, we'll learn more of the histories, uh, the customs, traditions that make this region so special. We want to collect and share the stories from every corner of the county, and you can help with that. If you have stories to share, or if you want to make sure that the stories of people you know get saved, please reach out to one of our partner organizations, and we can definitely help you save those stories and help bring them to the community. Thanks, everybody.